Well, it's Sunday evening, time for our meditation around the Word of God. Uh, going through Proverbs, as you well know, and tonight, chapter number 28. Proverbs 28. Does it seem like we could be that far along in the book? Redeem the time. Oh, it's getting away. Redeem the time. Paul admonished us. Chapter 28 of Proverbs, verse 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. A wicked man, he may act brave, but there's no real courage down in his heart because he knows he's lost, because he knows he's wrong. Because he knows he's under the wrath of God. Because he knows God's judgment. Ten commandments, a good starting place. He has violated them. He knows he's going to hell if the word of God is right. The wicked flee. One time in our King James Bible, hide. The wicked flee when no man is following them. No man is pursuing them. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. That word bold, they are as full of faith. They are as trusting. They are strong in the ability to rely on God. They're bold as a lion. That's that trust word, bold, uh, that can mean carefree, not worried about a thing. God said, he'll take care of all of my needs. Don't you love that little verse? The wicked flee when no man pursueth. I'm thinking of Gideon, the days of Gideon. <laughs> God cut him down to 300 men and their trumpets and their lamps. And 300 men took on the whole huge Midianite army. And all these men did. The sword of the Lord in Gideon and the trumpets blew and, and the lamps are shining. And those wicked men who were not bold at all turned, got scared, got confused, and hightailed it out of there. They ran. The wicked, the wicked were running when only 300 men <laughs> were pursuing them. That's a Bible illustration of that. And that fellow that acts so mean on your job, that big bully down in his heart, that is a fake, that is a false front. He has no real courage. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous, the righteous are as bold as a lion. I think of the three Hebrew children. King, we'll respect you, but we are not going to bow down. We are not going to worship that statue. You can throw us up. They are as bold as a lion. God took up for them. God vindicated them too. Daniel in the lion, bold as a lion. Bold even when cast into a den of lions. And yet, and yet, though the wicked flee when no man pursues, though they are so fearful, what they don't realize, every heartbeat, a wicked man is living under the wrath of God. Every time he takes a breath, He's one step closer to a devil's hell. The wrath of God is abiding upon. <laughs> They'll run at the sl slightest thing, even when it's not dangerous. But then they're not fearful of the thing that ought to frighten them. The holiness, the judgment, and the righteousness of an almighty God. Listen to John 3.36. I've got to get off this verse. He that believeth not... The wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God is on him right now. Verse 4. They that forsake God's law. Forsake, it can mean to forget about it. It's just not important to me. Or it can mean one time to refuse. Anybody that forsakes and refuses God's law, God's word... Anyone that forsakes God's law, turns on God's law, is praising a wicked man. If you don't believe the Bible, 
You have cast your lot. You have put your vote in with the wicked. You just well be bragging on the wicked. It's God's word or the way of the world. It's the truth of God or the lie of the devil. I want to quote Romans 3, 4. Let God be true and every man a liar. Oh my. They that forsake God's law praise the wicked. But those who keep the law will contend with the wicked. Boy, that's an unusual uh, turn. They that love God's law and obey God's law and will not forsake God, they'll contend with the wicked. Let me give you, dot my cardboard. Let me give you that verb for contend. It is, uh, it, it is uh, uh, six times in our King James Bible, they'll stir them up. Four times they'll meddle with them. Not in a bad sense. They'll strive with them. Let me try to put the verse together. They that forsake God's law, that's about where America is. They that forsake God's law, they're casting their lot with the wicked. They as well as praise the wicked. But those of us that keep, that means to honor, to respect, shamar, to obey uh, God's law, we're con our very lifestyle is contending with the wicked. If we live right in front of them living wrong, it's like rubbing salt into the wounds of their iniquity and of their sins. Can I pause there for about a minute or two? If you're loving God, if you're obeying God's Word, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're in church, you're trying to do everything that you're trying to do right, you're automatically... You're automatically opposing the wicked lifestyle of the world and the flesh and the death. There is going to come a time when we who are righteous are going to have to stand up against the wickedness of our age. There is a term, I've heard it all my Christian life, and yet it's taken on new meaning lately, being a prayer warrior. A prayer warrior like this. Lord, would you stop the wickedness in our country that is spreading like wildfire? Lord, Jesus said there was a day you were going to tell them you're cursed. Depart into everlasting fire to hell prepared for the devil and his angels. Lord, I'm just praying if they don't get saved. If the wicked who are trying to dismantle Christianity, if the wicked who are trying to rip the religious uh, foundations of our nation, Lord, if, if they don't get right, deal with them, contend, meddle with them, get in their face, tell them they're wrong, deal with the wicked. Six times, I counted them this morning in Matthew 23, Jesus puts a woe, a doom, a condemnation, a curse on hypocrites, wicked, lost Pharisees. If you're living wrong, whether you know it or not, you're praising all the wicked lifestyles of the world. If you're living right, you're contending with them. You're showing them up. You're exposing their error. Be a prayer warrior. Let's ask God to hold back the tide of the flood of iniquity that is inundating our land. Verse 9. It's along the same line. He that turns away, he just won't. He that turns away his ear from hearing God's law, God's word, the book. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer will be an abomination. If a man or a woman, listen ladies, will not obey that book, will not respect that book, will not read and love and honor that book, even when they pray, their prayer makes God sick. That word abomination carries the idea it's disgusting to God, it's nauseating to God. You'll love the book or you won't get your prayers answered. Hey, man, just to throw this in. Peter said, you'll love your wife and live with her and honor her, or that'll hinder your prayers. You won't get your prayers answered. David said, if you, have uncon if you regard iniquity in your heart, God won't even hear you. You won't get your prayers answered. If you don't love the Word, 
That's what verse 9 says. If you'll turn away your ear. I don't want to go to church. I get tired of hearing him preach. Turn away your ear from God's word, God's law. God will be nauseated when you try to pray. The works of a wicked man, the works of a hypocrite, no matter what he does, they're all totally bogus. They're all totally empty in the eyes of Almighty God. Didn't we have a verse, I think it was in Proverbs 21, even the plowing of the wicked is sin. He don't love God's Word. He doesn't respect the Holy Scriptures. Even when he plows his ox Monday morning, it's a sin. And certainly when he prays, it is a sin, rejecting God's Word. And that's exactly what's happening. I'm preaching sitting beside the pulpit. Can you make it out, the pulpit, at Family Baptist Church, where I preached this morning and again tonight in Lebanon, Tennessee, the Nashville area. And as I sit here, that's ex a lot of so-called preachers standing behind some pulpits have turned away their ear. They have perverted the Word of God. They'll never get a prayer answered. They're making God sick by their lifestyles. Verse 13. He that covers his sins. That's a PL participle verb. He that won't confess his sins. He hides his sins. Shall not prosper. Christian, this even applies to us. If you're hiding some sin in your life. You've got unforgiveness or bitterness and it's down in there. If you're sneaking and doing something your family don't know about, your job doesn't know about, if you're hiding, if you're not forsaking and confessing your sins, God won't bless you. You cannot prosper. But whoever will confess and forsake his sins, God will have mercy on that man. God will have God will put His blessings on that man. Don't let me give you, let me give you the word confess. It's yada. It's the yada verb. I take my sin. Oh my! I'm just going to name it. I'm going to tell God about. It. And you toss it heavenward. Lord, I lost my temper. I don't need to tell you. You already know. Lord, could you forgive me? Lord, I said an ugly word. Lord, I got mad. I shouldn't have done it. And I failed you. Lord, I've let you down. I've told you I was trying to quit. And I am. Lord, I confess it. If you will confess your sins and forsake them, walk away from them, let them go, my Bible says, God Almighty. Now, I got it right in front of me. God Almighty will have mercy on you. He will bless you. He will hear you. And he will forgive you. And then I got to talking about covering your sins. I don't even know if that's possible. Not for long. David went a year before he confessed his sins to God, the Bathsheba affair. But he could only go a year. Nathan the prophet said, David, thou art the man. If you're, right, if you're saved, if you're born again, in that sense you have God's right. You won't go long with unconfessed sin. He'll get a hold of you. Adam, what are you doing? He's, he's hiding his sin. Got fig leaves. Him and his wife strode all over his body. He's naked. He's ashamed. Would you rather wear the fig leaves of embarrassment, the fig leaves of hiding your sin? Or would you rather go ahead and get it right, get it under the blood, and let God slay an animal, and then he covered Adam and Eve with robes, probably some bloody robes, robes indicating the righteousness of, of a coming Savior. If you've got something you're hiding, confess it and forsake it and God will bless you again. If you're trying to cover it, you won't prosper. God won't smile upon you. That's an amazing verse. Verse 15. It doesn't sound all that important, but I've got to include it. As a roaring lion... That could be frightening. As a raging bear, a bear's upset going back and forth through the forest, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. It is so important that a nation has a godly leader. God could bless Judah when Josiah was in power or Hezekiah. 
or, or, or for that matter, at times when King Jehoshaphat was living right, but he could not bless Judah in the days that wicked kings were ruling. You just well made a, you, you just well come across a roaring lion. He might kill you, but you bet. Or a raging bear slap you upside the head and take you, slit your throat, take your life. That's the same condition of a people who are living under a wicked, who are living under a wicked ruler. Righteousness exalteth a nation. That's what God says. If you got a good king, God will bless you. But not so with a wicked king or a wicked ruler. Can I pause a minute? Oh, how we need to pray for America. I'm recording this and you're well aware we're in July, August, September, October, three months. And we'll make a decision as a country. We'll decide on the next president of the United States. Will we vote for somebody that, that, that tries to have a semblance of Bible, Judeo, Christian ethic? Or will we vote for somebody that's already said they'll not stand with the nation of Israel? Somebody that's all, I, all I'm saying is this. If America ends up, I don't know who it might be. We have uh, the, the political parties have not even officially nominated their candidates yet. But if we end up with a wicked ruler, we're in trouble. We Christians are in trouble. We better pray. God will roll back the flood tide of iniquity that's rolling our way. And God will one more time, one more election, Dare we ask for two? Put somebody in power who has a passion for the Bible, a passion for Israel, a passion for the Lord Jesus, a passion for standing against idolatry. A roaring lion and a ranging bear sounds dangerous, but no more dangerous than the wrong kind of leadership. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. You can tell what wrong, wrong leadership is by looking at the Senate and a lot of the House of Representatives today. God help America. Verse 19. He that tills his land, he'll have plenty of bread. Oh, that word till it. Abad, A-B-A-D. It is a Hebrew verb that means to serve. To be a slave to. If a farmer, if a man is a hard worker, he gets out there and he's a slave plowing, he's a slave planting, he's a slave killing off the weeds, he's a slave irrigating if it need be. If you till your land, God will bless you. You will have crops and you'll have plenty. It means you'll be satisfied. But he that follows after Vain people. He that makes friends with vain people, they'll be poor. They'll have poverty. And work hard, God will bless it and you'll have something. Follow wicked, vain, good for nothing men, you'll end up poor, you'll end up hungry, and you'll end up lacking. Let me tell you what that says. That says the man is not falling anymore. Don't go out and look for it tomorrow morning. Go to work. Get a job and be industrious, be diligent in serving your boss, your supervisor, and in serving your God of that plan. Do you know how hard your preacher works to plow the fields of the Word of God and to cultivate and get a sermon to preach to you tonight at church or Wednesday night or next Sunday morning? He, wor he works diligently. And that's why God gives you plenty. That's why God feeds you well when he preaches. Anybody, another verse on wrong companions. Anybody that's running around following the riffraff, following the simpletons, the fools of, uh, uh, of this world, the vain, it means empty people, people with no purpose in life, they're going to lack. They're going to lack. A good, hard-working preacher's plowing the ground, plowing up our hearts, 
And the Holy Ghost can give the implanted word. That's what James calls it. The implanted word. And said that'll save you. That'll deliver you. That'll give you victory. Work hard on your land. Plow diligently and you'll have plenty. That word diligently. That's the New Testament word. Peter said giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue. And giving all diligence. Add to your virtue knowledge. And giving all diligence. Add to your knowledge. And on and on and on. Diligent spoo day, giving it everything you got. Are you living for Jesus a hundred percent, ninety miles an hour, giving him every, loving him with all your heart and soul and mind and might? Verse twenty-one. To have respect of persons is not good. We're living in a day when if one person commits it, it's wrong. But if another person does the same thing, we'll look the other way. It's right. Oh, my, in this liberal day where wrong is being called right and right is being called wrong. What a, to have the respect of persons. I'm looking away. That's my buddy. To have respect of persons is not good. I'm afraid there have been a lot of judicial decisions handed down in backslidden America that favored an interest group just to get their votes, not based on right and wrong. To have respect to persons, that's not good. Never could I make an announcement, God is no respecter of persons. Could I quote the line of a little song, red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. To have respect of persons is not good. For a piece of bread, that man will transgress. For a piece of bread, that man will rebel. If you can buy somebody off to turn their head, a judge to turn their head at this guilty party, he'll somehow work it out. The sentence is light, or it's all suspended, or, or he ends up just saying, no, I don't see enough wrong here. We don't have enough to go to trial. And he's respecting persons. He's acting that way toward his golf buddy. That's not good. And that judge, he'll sell out for anything. He'll sell out for popular opinion. He'll sell out for political expediency. He'll sell out for a, a season ticket up at the sports arena. He'll sell out for, for a piece of bread. That man will transgress. Now I want to turn this into a question. What would it take to buy you off? Preacher, what would it take to get you to mention hell a little less often? What would it take to get you to maybe not preach against sin and preach separation stronger? Just back off a little, preacher. We could get five new families if you just zip it on some of these hard issues you've got to ha always harp about and carry on. Three words. I want some amens coming in here. Not for sale. Not for sale. I'll not sell out for a piece of bread. I'll not sell out for a bigger church. I'll not sell out for more popular pulpits and affluent. I'll not sell out. I don't want to be a respecter of persons. I want to preach it just like God's word says. And if you think you're being partial, ask God to forgive you and get it straightened out. Verse 24. Whoever robs his father and his mother and says, I've done nothing wrong. It is no transgression. That man is a companion of a destroyer. Another verse on honoring your mama and your daddy. Don't steal from your parents. I have an uncle. God saved him. He went into evangelism. God's used him to bring hundreds, I suppose thousands, into the kingdom of God. He's dead now. He's in heaven. He stole from his daddy. Grandpa Green had a country store, and, and my uncle would steal things out of his daddy's store and, and, and do whatever with it. He never forgave him. said, God forgave him. I could never forgive himself for that. He grieved over the fact. Oh my, whoever robs, plucks, seizes from his father or his mother and said, I didn't do anything wrong. That man is a companion. That man is a companion of a destroyer. He's a companion of fools. He's a companion of wicked men. Honor your mama. Honor your daddy. Didn't we see the other day, even when she's old, stand by her and respect her. 
I was looking for an example of somebody robbing from their mom and dad. I found one. It's in the book of Judges. It's chapter 17. His name is Micah, and he stole 1,100 shekels of silver from his mama. Went into her safety area, whatever, and stole from his mama. He ended up being a companion of destroyers. He ended up running his life. Don't, oh my, here I am preaching, don't steal from your daddy. Don't steal from your mama. How's this one going to work? Don't steal from Almighty God either. <gasps> Brother Bagel, I'm not even going to steal from mama and daddy, and I'm sure not going to steal from God. Well, that's odd. In Malachi chapter 3, God said, some of you have robbed me. Some of you have stolen. Lord, not us. When? When did we ever rob you? Say, in your tithes, in your offerings. If God told you to tithe to your church, and I believe he has, you don't do it. You're stealing. You're robbing from God. That's probably worse than robbing from your mom and daddy. You promised the missionary, I'm going to help you now. You'll be getting $25 a month. And then the roof started leaking and you forgot the missionary. Or you got the flat tire you had to, and you forgot the missionary. If you promised, if you promised you were going to send that money, probably God's holding you accountable for sending that money. You could be robbing from God by lying to that missionary. You said, you were, I, I don't want to get into meddling or anything like that. I don't want somebody to do it. I'm just telling you what, don't steal. Don't take what belongs to somebody else, mama or daddy or, or, or whomever. Don't take from God either. You say, preacher, what can I do? I, by your definition, I've been robbing from God. Pay it back if you can. And if you can't pay it back, start giving him what he's due this week and next week and the next. You say, that's not important. In Malachi 3, in that text, God says, if you're robbing from me, I will release, I will loose the devourer on you. I'll let things go that will gobble up your money. You won't give me my uh, little bit. I'll let something go that will gobble up everything you got. Could be ill health. Could be a job firing you. Could be no telling. Uh, I will not rebuke the devourer if you rob from me. Debbie and I, Help a missionary or two, and it's an honor to do so. God's helped us be faithful. I believe if we ever have to quit, I'm going to write them and explain it. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to rob from them. And by the way, i, I got to get off this. The more that I give to God, I find the more God blesses me. I had a preacher buddy. He's in heaven now. He said, Bagwell, we call each other that. We meant it, and we were good friends. You'll never outgive God. That's what he said. You, I've heard him say it a hundred times. You'll never outgive God. Don't rob from your mama. Don't rob from your daddy. Don't rob from God. And for goodness sake, give what you've promised. Give what you... And if you do know somebody you've robbed, if you do know somebody from whom you've stolen, a former employer or, or that fellow down on, on you, in that little storage, pay it back somehow, some way. Figure it out. Pay it back. God will bless you. Verse 26. Last verse. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. It literally means he's stupid. He's a dullard. He's a simpleton. Trust in your own heart. That's that lean on. Believe it. If you trust on in your own heart, you are a fool. But whoso walketh wisely lives according to God's plan. He will be delivered. He will be rescued. God will take care of you. Trust in your own heart or trust in the Lord. Remember Proverbs 3, a long time ago. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct. Let's don't trust our own heart. Let Jeremiah said it, chapter 17, I think verse 9. The heart is deceitful. It is desperately wicked. Even Paul in Romans 7 told us some things that were in his heart and he's ashamed. Oh, oh despicable man that I am. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. I don't know the right way to go. My ways are not as high as God's ways. My thoughts cannot equal. I better get God's ways and God's thoughts. and go. Don't trust in your own heart. That's a foolish thing. 
but whoever walks wisely. Remember wisdom? Seeing life like God sees it. Understanding, responding to life, obeying life the way God sees it. If you walk wisely, He'll deliver you. He'll rescue you. That is Psalm 1 in microcosm. Don't go around with the ungodly. Don't trust yourself. Trust God, God's Word. Meditate in it day and night, and He will He will deliver you. He'll make you like a tree planted by the river. You'll bring forth fruit in your season. You'll never be unfruitful. Your leaf will never wither. Whatever you do will prosper. Don't trust your own heart. Trust in God. Those are our verses today on a Sunday evening. Pray for me. Uh, within an hour and a half, I'll be standing in that pulpit again, preaching to a congregation of God's people right out here in front of me. I'm looking forward to that. Would you pray God will bless and honor His Word? And then Thursday night, I don't preach again till Thursday night, begin a revival in Marietta, Georgia, and then Sunday, and then next week in a revival. It's all again just busy, busy, busy. Far as I know, week after week, pray for the Bagwells for strength as we try to serve Him. And I always ask it. Many of you participate. And if you don't, it's okay. What verse stood out? I, I love to know. It helps me. What did the Holy Ghost say to you tonight? What did you learn that you'll not soon forget? Maybe never forget. When you share that, it encourages my heart. Father, thank you for your word. Would you bless those who've heard tonight? Would you give us wisdom? You said if we would ask, you'd give it liberally, graciously. We ask and we trust you for it. And then may we apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.